from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Today, uh, I'm with uh, Mary Roach, who is the author of six books about science. Her topics have included human digestion, the human cadaver, and humans in outer space. Her newest book, Grunt, looks at the curious science of humans at war. The book includes vintage Roach, boundless curiosity, and infectious enthusiasm, all written with a delightful sense of humor, and there are, of course, lots of maggots throughout the book. <laughs> one, reviewer, like, one reviewer likened her to the perfect dinner guest, rolling out one surprising story after another, and I found that to be very true reading this one and reading her previous books. Grunt isn't a look at the ballistics of war or the raw power of nuclear bombs, which you might think of as military science. Her book, like all her other books, is a study primarily of the human body. And she says, I'm interested in the parts no one makes movies about. Not the killing, but the keeping alive. Mary, thanks for being with us today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, as I've said, you've written about space and, and sex and the human body and, and um, why the science of humans at war? Uh, well, it's a, it's a topic that I got interested in in a, a kind of unusual way. I was reporting uh, a Smithsonian magazine piece on the world's hottest chili peppers. I was in India. And uh, while I was there, somebody said, oh, the Indian Defense Ministry took these chili peppers and made a, a non-lethal weapon, kind of an explode, essentially a pepper spray, but in a powder bomb. That, and I thought, well, I need to report on that. So I went over to the um, Indian Defense Ministry's lab, and I spent a day kind of poking around, as I do, and they were working on that. They had been working on a leech repellent, which fascinated me, and I thought that at that point, I just realized that military science is a little broader and more esoteric than I had thought, and it just planted a seed that, that might, this might be a sort of roachable territory, as it were. Um, and um, that's what, and then when I got home, there was a, I, I happened to be corresponding with a retired army pathologist um, who had, uh, I, I think he'd read Stiff, I'm guessing, and I said, you know, I'm sort of thinking about military science, but I think access would be a problem. What do you think? And he said, I don't, I think you should try it. And he introduced me to people at the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System at Walter Reed. And he really sort of opened some doors and encouraged me to run with it, which I did. And was the, was the military pretty responsive in, in having you poke around? Uh, they were surprisingly uh, receptive to it. You know, it was um, a lot of times, it, it, it took a year to get, uh, I spent some time on a um, ballistic missile submarine out at sea. That took about a year to set up, not because people were saying no, but because nobody knew who's the person to, to say yes. So it would be like, you'd, you'd start with the, you know, you'd have the submarine group and then the, you know, the, the naval operations person and the, you know, and then, you know, so you got, I would get approval all the way up at the top. And then we had to find who wants to be the submarine captain who goes, yeah, yeah, she can come on my boat, you know. <laughs> so that took some doing. So, but people were, um, people at the, at the Department of Defense were, I, I think they were, you know, these are stories that don't get told and they're positive stories. They're stories about scientists who are trying to make this very difficult experience of serving in the military in combat, trying to make it a little more bearable and safer. So it's a story that I think they were happy to tell. So it was, it was surprisingly, um, they, were, they were very helpful, in fact. I mean, they, they didn't, you know, they didn't uh, have a chance to vet the manuscript. It wasn't that sort of like, well, we'll let you in, but in return, we have to see the manuscript. They were, they had no real input. They didn't really know what I was doing, except in a very general sense, you know. So one of, the, one of the interesting things I learned in the book is it's not just about keeping a soldier alive but it's also ensuring that they have a decent quality of life if they have an injury or what have you. And if I can just read just a, two sentences. Um, the long-term quality of a soldier or a Marine's life is a relatively new consideration. In the past, military decision makers have concerned themselves more with go, with go no go. Do the injuries keep a soldier from contemplating her mission? Have we lost another pawn in the game? Uh, do you have any, any examples of, of ways that they're trying to improve the life of a soldier? 
uh, well, the whole book is, uh, right. I mean, there's every, you know, anything from, you know, heat injury and heat stroke, which in recent conflicts has been a, a big issue, uh, to diarrhea, which people tend to think of that that's it's kind of a teehee topic, um, historically speaking. I mean, this was, you know, you look at conflicts like the, 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 the Mexican War of 1848, seven deaths from dysentery and disease to one combat death. Um, in, in recent years with improvements in sanitation, you don't have the same situation where you have those like um, sort of a mess tent set up right next to a field latrine and flies going back and forth and no refrigeration and you know hundreds of troops getting sick with things like typhoid fever and dysentery and dying. So now we don't have that, but we still in like the special operations forces who are still out in remote areas eating, you know, they're not on the base where it's very sanitized. So there's a uh, very, very high food poisoning rates. So uh, just all manner of things that you don't necessarily think about as risks of combat. These are, um, these are the things that you know, I look at in the book. And you said at some point in the book that the cost of, uh, I guess, combating food poisoning could be as much as the cost of combating post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, no, is they were talking about uh, something, it's called um, the, their post-infectious consequences of severe food poisoning, um, irritable bowel, and there's something called reactive arthritis. So uh, that you can, you have a five-fold greater increase of developing after you've had a severe case of food poisoning. So, and that's a, a, a you, you know, the VA will cover benefits for that. So the, the, the diarrhea person, the diarrhea expert that I spoke to, his feeling was that that could rival, you know, expenditures, um, what is spent on PTSD. So. It, it is, you know, definitely a, it's a, it's a bigger problem and not one that sort of is, is obvious to people when they think about serving in the military. And am I correct in, in recalling that, and if I am, this is a real eye-opening fact when I read the book, that um, a cholera patient could discharge, like, what is it, five gallons of effluence? It's, yeah, that, that's the, the statistic that I heard. I mean, so much so that um, and there's a Navy Captain Phillips who... Uh, I forget which year exactly, but uh, one of his uh, contributions, among others, was the invention of something called the cholera cot, which is a cot with a hole right here and a bucket, just because it, uh, just the, you can't keep changing the bed quickly enough. It's a, and, and, and that's why it's so fatal. You just dehydrate so quickly. So, uh, yeah. Um, and let's get to the maggots. I know I brought it up in the introduction. <laughs> uh, they found that, interestingly, that uh, a maggot can be used to clean a wound. Yeah, this was a, a World War I discovery. There was a, um, uh, a surgeon with the French Expeditionary Forces who was uh, uh, seeing patients. A few patients had come in who'd been out in the bush for a few, in the field for a few days, coming in with big wounds that had been in, infested with maggots. And of course, the natural response is to get those out of there, they're, you know, a fear that they're going to promote infection. And what Dr. Baer kept seeing over and over in these patients, in these soldiers, was that when they took away the maggots, there was this fresh, pink, healthy tissue coming in, and there was no infection, which was ran counter to what one would expect. And he noticed this over and over, and in fact, 10 years later in civilian life, decided to try that with some cases of uh, stubborn infections that weren't responding to normal treatment. And in fact, they do work really well, because what a maggot does is it just performs a natural debridement. Uh, that that debridement is uh, taking away the dead tissue to encourage, to, pre to prevent infection, encourage the growth of new tissue. So that maggots, as we all know, like they like dead stuff. So by putting them in there, and you have to, there's a dosage for maggot therapy. Maggot therapy is still done today. Uh, there's a, you need a prescription. It has a Medicare billing code. Yes, there's a Medicare <laughs> reimbursement code. Uh, and a dosage, and you, you, they put something called a cage dressing. So you have this little community there on your leg or your foot. It's often you know, diabetic patients with foot ulcers that are um, difficult to treat. Uh, so, and, and you would think that it's a, a very disturbing, upsetting thing to have maggots feeding upon you in any capacity. But in fact, if you have that kind of infection that is um, not going away, and here's a possible treatment, um, you welcome it to the point, uh, to the extent that some of the uh, uh, folks um, who, who have been patients of maggot therapy, uh, they, they are t-shirts that the, the company, Medical Maggots, has t-shirts that say, maggots on board. <laughs> so, 
people kind of proclaim to the world, and, and they, in fact, they kind of get involved in this little community. And they're not, because they're, 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 when you put them in, they're kind of the size of a cupcake sprinkle. They're tiny. They're not the big, fat, kind of squirmy Halloween horror story <laughs> maggot that we're used to envisioning. Uh, they're, they're, they're small, and they all kind of, they go head down into the wound. They actually immerse themselves and feed in that way, so they're just, their butts are sticking, they actually breathe through their ass. So, <laughs> among the maggots, many charms. <laughs> it's an ass breather. <laughs> so, they, uh, so they're all kind of, they, they're, they're just the little butts are sticking up. Kind of looks, reminded me of on an accordion, all the array of buttons. Just these little kind of squirmy buttons. So, it, so it isn't quite, I envision this like, ah, this sort of like, the thing you see in a, a gross out movie, but it's not, really like that. Anyway. And, uh, <laughs> I told you, this is like yeah, our sorry. favorite part of Mary. <laughs> uh, so what happens if one of these maggots inadvertently turns into a fly? I mean, it wouldn't be inadvertent. It's its natural course. But yeah, it flies around that's, the that's, that is why, that's one of the reasons um, it, it, it's been a bit of an uphill battle for advocates of maggot therapy, you know, trying to introduce, I'm trying, what is the maggot sign? That's I, the maggot sign. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, the um, yeah, because uh, uh, what a maggot a maggot is just a feeding machine, and it wants to uh, eat enough to prepare itself to go off for its very sci-fi journey, where it's going to go off pupate and become a fly. So uh, you want to you have to um, remove them after a couple of days, as so as you don't want them leaving the trying to leave the wound and go pupate, because then you have flies in your hospital. <laughs> That's and the last thing that you want. So it's a, a maggot therapy. Maggots are cheap, but the, you need uh, nursing staff to, to change them, to change the cage dressing, to make sure they're not left in too long to the point where they're all uh, trying to go off and hide and pupate and become flies. Yeah. And you, I guess, in the course of your research, had looked at that the Office of Strategic Service was looking at using flies as a, as a weapon of war oh, in southern Morocco, I think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the OSS, uh, which is the precursor to the CIA, uh, Stanley, Stanley Lovell, who is a head of research, uh, an imaginative fellow, uh, had this idea that, because um, they were trying to, this was in, in um, North Africa, they were, there was a, a region in Spanish Morocco, it was called, and they were trying to uh, stop the Nazis from heading in and cutting off supply line. Anyway, they, they uh, his idea was to create a, a simulated, there were a lot of goats in the area, create a simulated goat dung that would be spiked with pathogens. The flies would then land on the simulated goat dung, pick up the pathogens, and go land on the Nazis' food, inoculate the food or the Nazis directly with these pathogens, uh, and thereby uh, covertly destroy uh, these, these groups of of Nazis who were there. So that was, that was the idea. Um, it was called Operation Capricious. It never, because it's sort of play on Cap Cap Capricorn, goat. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, right. Uh, a little obscure. <laughs> um, so uh, it never, it was, uh, the, they, never, they never deployed the special dung. And oh, this was the best part. They were going to drop the dung from airplanes in the middle of the night. <laughs> And he said in his memoir, I figured there's so much dung around, no one would really notice. I think you notice when someone's <laughs> dropping goat dung in the middle of the night. I think that's not normal. Or it falls on your tent. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, but it was uh, an idea that wasn't, it was, it, that's as far as it went. I think it was just about, it went as, about, probably about as far as a cocktail napkin, yeah. But, but looking through the, the, the dung and the flies, you did find um, a product called Who, Me? Who, Me? Yeah. This was another fanciful Stanley Lovell uh, idea, and this one was actually, two years were spent on this. This is, again, World War II, and uh, it, was, it was an idea that uh, Lovell stole from um, the Brits. The Brits had something called stench liquid, uh, and wh what, the, what this was, it was a, uh, meant to be a cheap, small, covertly deployed uh, tube or atomizer of hideous stink, and this would be distributed to motivated citizens, who, you know, saboteurs, who would then, um, when they spotted a Japanese or a Nazi officer, sidle up and deploy 
this, and it was treated like a, a weapon. There was like the ra it was supposed to have a range of 10 feet. There could be no backfire, obviously. Um, the British one actually had a compound that would delay the onset of the stench so that the operator could disappear before the <laughs> stench hit. So it was a lot of thinking, and uh, two, two years of work, and uh, um, some big fat files in the OSS archives were dedicated to this. Um, SAC 23 was the, the technical term, who me, was uh, the nickname that Stanley Lovell gave it. The idea being uh, it, would, it was supposed to just smell like, um, his, this is his words, not Mary Roach's, uh, a very loose bowel movement. <laughs> so the idea was to humiliate and destroy morale, and you know, just uh, you know, just every little bit helps in uh, these war <laughs> efforts. Uh, so th th thus began this uh, highly uh, entertaining, to me anyway, back and forth of letters between um, the Arthur Little Chemical Company, who were trying to come up with a, an, an odor that was not only. Um, repellent, but universally in all cultures uh, would be considered repellent and just a little bit weird so that it was un unidentifiable. They wanted it like a mix, not entirely the, uh, the loose BM, but uh, something added to it so that it would be scary as well as hideous. So that's what you want with a, um, a malodorant. And those are still the things that, uh, you know, more recently, um, the military has funded, uh, you know, into crowd dispersal, that kind of thing. Um, so you want you want it to be foreign smelling. So somebody goes, I don't know what that is, and it's freaking me out. I'm going to leave. So it's got to be not only foul but a little bit confusing, unidentifiable, and scary. So there was uh, so the, the back and forth, and then the testing began, and they were testing it in like tropical conditions and Arctic conditions, and it had to be, you know, the tubes would have to withstand a certain amount of drop force, and then they would be delivered to the people who were testing them, and they'd show up, and half of them were leaking, and then the, they, had, they had a lot of problems with blowback and backfire <laughs> and dribble. Uh, so a lot of angry letters back and forth between uh, the people who had, you know, commissioned these, uh, the, the, both the stink and the deployment system. <laughs> Uh, and uh, in the end, uh, Humi, they, they, they produced a whole batch of it, uh, and then uh, seven, 17 days later, after the final, final report on Humi, um, the first bomb was dropped on the Japanese. So uh, they never, so the stink bomb never was deployed. Yeah. yeah. And, but they also found that, that like a stench or a smell is not universal, and that it can also hinge on uh, yes. the environment. Yeah. And, yeah, that's right. I mean, if you take uh, butyric acid, is uh, if you smell it in a in a deli, you know, a cheese shop, it's this. It's part. You sniff a piece of Parmesan cheese. That is the, that's butyric acid. Uh, it's also uh, the, the it's vomit. The smell of vomit. So depending on the context, it's uh, you know, it's kind of a pleasant cheesy smell, or it's a, um, a unpleasant vomit smell. It's all. <laughs> And the, uh, the Monell Chemical Census Center, who's done some work more recently for the military on, on malodor malodorants, uh, and you know, for dispersing a mob or clearing a clearing a space, a compound, or whatever, um, they, they in the 1990s traveled around with this woman, Pam Dalton, traveled around, and in her, her suitcase she had little bottles. Uh, she had it, vomit, sewage, burnt hair, and U.S. government standard bathroom malodor, and she. <laughs> Which was, in fact, the winner, um, this being a compound developed in World War II for testing latrine deodorants. You need a standardized, hideous latrine smell <laughs> against which you try out your latrine deodorants. So this compound, uh, this was the winner internationally, globally, culturally. Because uh, you, you know, you, she would take these odors around and, and uh, just presenting them to people out of context, uh, something like 3% of Caucasians found vomit to be a wearable scent, like a little, <laughs> just a little. Um, the, <laughs> sewage in many cultures, well, there was a percentage of people who thought, yeah, that's edible. <laughs> I would eat that. So uh, US government standard bathroom malodor was the winner. What was interesting is that the, um, once you had that, that universally offensive and hideous smell, um, the, 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 the subtlety here, which this is why you need the pros at the Monell Chemical Census Center, they added a fruity floral top note, the top note being the first thing you get. So when you're exposed to a, a new smell, you are tentative, you take a little whiff, and that's, that was the fruity floral. And then you're encouraged, because that's pleasant, to take a big uh, keeper inhale. <laughs> so on the keeper <laughs> inhale, you would get this onslaught of this hideous uh, 
smell. So uh, that whole package is known as stench soup. <laughs> and that is, I don't know where stench soup was deployed, and neither does Pam Dalton. It's, she said, I gave them the formula. I don't know what they did with it. So. <laughs> Somewhere out there, probably somebody's got a supply of stench soup. I myself had some that sat in my closet in a little vial for a long, long time, uh, with, you know, encased in activated charcoal, and I finally got the courage on the book tour to open it up, and there was a lot of fanfare, like, I'm going to open this up. It was at a big event, and I was going to, um, I thought of taking it to, no, never mind. I was getting. Let's <laughs> throw some out here. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, all of the scent had been absorbed into the activated carbon, and so it was this large anticlimactic moment. But uh, I did smell some at Monell, and it is, it is, that you do not open that without the fume hood, you know, under the fume hood with the fans going, and that's, it's pretty bad. So I guess one. I should have brought some. Can you imagine? Well, aren't you curious now? <laughs> Spritz. So uh, one of the most life-changing injuries that you've discussed in the book are injuries to to, to the penis and the male yes. genitals. And this is, um, um, I guess, was kind of an awkward subject for a lot of people. I'm sure yes. it was awkward for the military as well. But what are yeah, some of the improvements yeah. that they're making there? Um, yeah, uh, urogenital trauma is the, the more technical term, and. Um, it's become, in, in recent conflicts, it's become more of a problem for two reasons. One, the, the, um, the size of the bombs, the IEDs, yeah, they're bigger. The, so it's not like you know, a landmine you would tend to have you know, lost a limb, maybe, maybe to here, maybe here. And now these are bigger explosions going up to the, the pelvic region. And the other thing that's happened is that um, medical uh, emergency trauma care has, in the field has become better and faster, so more men are surviving to have these injuries to the groin area, the penis. And uh, so um, there's surgical, I was at, a, uh, at Walter Reed where there was a, um, they were repairing the urethra of a young man who'd, had, who'd sustained such an injury. And, and it, was, it was fascinating in that, um, you know, I came into the operating room and, and you know, they, light, they put the blankets, you know, the, I don't know, drapes, I guess they're called surgical drapes, and normally they, you know, they just leave the part that they're working on, and uh, oddly they were all they were up at his face, which I thought odd. And but what they're doing, they take a, a rectangle of the inside of the cheek, because that's first of all it's hairless, and for a urethra you don't want it there to be hair because um, minerals can collect on the hair, and you can end up with, with stones, and, and so you don't want you don't want hair. Uh, and you also want tissue that is going to be able to withstand an, a moist environment, uh, and the inside of the cheek is that. So they took a little rectangle and they would roll it into a tube and use it basically to patch the urethra. And in that way, um, he would still be able to pee through his penis rather than, because if you can't do that, they thread it through the perineum. Perineum? Perineum. Uh, it's a word I've often... <laughs> Red, but not heard. Yes, red, but not heard. <laughs> anyway, the taint, I believe the taint is the, <laughs> the more casual term. Anyway, they would have to thread the urethra, and you would, uh, the, then he would have to sit down over the toilet to pee. And I had this conversation in the operating room with the surgeon and the assisting surgeon. The assisting surgeon was a woman. The surgeon was a man. And I said, you know, how big a deal is that to have to pee, you know, through the, the pee word, the perineum? <laughs> the taint, and he said, he's the surgeon, said, well, given all of the other challenges of, you know, losing a limb, et cetera, and I, I don't think it's that big a deal, and the woman turned to me, the, the assisting surgeon said, it's huge. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, uh, and so the surgery was, you know, I, it, it did what it was supposed to do, and uh, he's now able to urinate normally, and, uh, and while I was there, they, um, the surgeon happened to mention something going on at Johns Hopkins, which, and this was about two years ago, I hadn't heard about that they were, he said over at Johns Hopkins right now, they are, they're, um, there's a surgeon, they're doing um, uh, what's called a wet run, which is um, using cadavers to work out the logistics of uh, a penis transplant. And the first penis transplant was a, a few months ago. Uh, and it, that was at Mass General, not um, Johns Hopkins. But I was able to see, and, and it was just, Fascinating. It was you know they had two two bodies, you know the recipient and the donor, uh, and one circumcised and one not, which was interesting. Uh, doesn't they're dead? Doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, 
anyway, just to, you know, they and, and they had it. They had this set up where um, had a, a like you know an IV and a, a bag of um, dyed saline, dyed blue, and you could you know turn the stopcock, and they they had hooked it up to a certain artery, and they could then see what region was perfused by this artery, and that would tell them you know is this a critical artery to reattach? Is this you know a, is, is this an important one, and how much? Material do we take? You know, you don't just lop it off like a tree. I mean, you got to take the roots. You got to take. Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I don't even remember what your question. Was. <laughs> this was two chapters. <laughs> uh, um, oh, but I was going to say, you had asked me what sorts of things are, are are being done, and one of the things that I found interesting was that the uh, some of the surgical techniques, the reconstruction, not transplantation, and not just repairing a urethra, but reconstruction. Some of that is, um, it, you know, a collaboration between um, military surgeons and transgender surgeons. So that, you know, you don't often sort of imagine the military and the transgender sort of community, like I don't know, getting together and helping each other. It was lovely, lovely. So one more question on this, and then I'll move to underwear. <laughs> Um, actually, I think I just forgot my question. So we'll move on to underwear. Uh, why are silk underwear um, the best underwear to wear in a war zone? Uh, well, silk, silk is uh, surprisingly strong. Um, it's very lightweight and strong. And so it's, it's, uh, it's used to, I mean, it's not, it's not going to be bulletproof, but in terms of, I mean, people think of Kevlar, they think just that Kevlar, you could we make a pair of underpants that would be bulletproof, but you'd need, a, you'd need like 15 to 40 plies to be actually, yeah, it's not going to be a comfortable pair of underpants. Uh, so um, silk, it, silk is almost as protective, I mean, in terms of just, you know, a, a, a light layer. And, and it's not protecting against a bomb or a gunshot, but what it's protecting you against uh, if there's an IED explosion, you know, the, the tremendous amount, because these are buried bombs, so they are launching um, at very high speed dirt, sand, debris, uh, and a lot of pathogens. And what happens when an IED, you step on an IED or very near an IED, it, the tissue kind of blows out and the debris blow goes in and then the tissue comes back mm -hmm. and you can ha just have horrendous recurring infection. So uh, underwear or what, what you know, it, not necessarily just for underwear, but uh, that, that's, it's very good, whether it's silk or, or um, a few plies of Kevlar, it's, it's, it's keeping that material from penetrating. So um, there isn't any, so you used to read, there was a time when one of these companies was sort of marketing bomb-proof underwear, um, which, you know, as the guy at, at Natick Labs where they work on underwear, uh, he said, you know, if they can develop, you know, if the insurgents can make a bomb that will flip a mine-resistant armed personnel carrier, they can certainly make a bomb that's going to blow up your underwear. So it's not, it's not bomb-proof, but it does help a lot in, uh, in preventing infection. Yeah. And uh, when you're a combat medic, you're in a real high-stress situation. And, I mean, a lot of us, our, our instinct's not to, like, focus on one thing. Right. And right. you observed medics yeah. getting trained. Yes, yeah, yeah the, um, yeah, the challenge, like you mentioned, uh, if you're in a scenario where there's loud noises and people shooting, uh, whether they're shooting at you or not, it's a, a, you have a burst of adrenaline and a fight or flight response. And what that does, it makes you fast, strong, and dumb, is the way they describe it. It, it makes you able to run away, throw a big rock, whatever, you know, the, the just sort of brute strength. It, it does not help you focus, make good cognitive choices, um, operate uh, delicate machinery, uh, or, or cut an airway in somebody who's struggling to breathe. Um, because you, you, it, 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 what it does for you is the opposite of what you need. So uh, combat medics and, Na and Navy corpsmen who provide medical care for the Marine Corps, they're trained uh, at places like Strategic Operations, which is this old movie studio, big movie studio near Camp Pendleton. Uh, this, uh, the guy who owns it used to do action movies and war movies, so he's got a lot of uh, technology for loud noises, pyrotechnics, um, and he employs actors to, to, to play injured people, um, including amputee actors. The day I was there, was this, there was this amputee who had a, a sleeve over the, his leg, and it had been um, very artfully designed with gore, and it had a backpack with just the right amount of stage blood and a pump, and it would pump, and so he could, and he could control the bleed in a realistic way, and depending on how the medic uh, applied the tourniquet, could 
either be saved or die, and uh, was acting, you know, that role along with it, and screaming and making, you know, making things as stressful as possible for this young man, so that he could practice doing care in a stressful environment, and the hope being, if you can, if you do it a few times in a safe environment, and and learn to cope with that and, and maintain your focus, hopefully you'll be a little better off when the real deal unfolds overseas. So that is part of the training. And it, it, it's, it's fairly in, intensive. I mean, there were pyrotechnics. They had dust hits, so it looked like rifle fire was hitting the ground. Um, and it was, and all, the, all the while, the, the, the instructors were sort of yelling and adding to the stress in that sort of boot camp marine instructor way. Uh, so it was you know, not a pleasant day for those young men about, and women, but hopefully helpful for them in the long term. So I'll ask one more question, and then we'll turn it over uh, to questions from the audience. But um, I guess the highest achievement in, in, this, in the science of war would be making war not lethal. Is there any chance of that happening? Oh, uh, well, if it's all, if it's all f well, not lethal to both sides or to one side? <laughs> I, was, I guess both. I guess if it's not lethal to one side, maybe it's not lethal to the other. Well, that, then it's called diplomacy. <laughs> well, that's true, too. Good and point. And I'm all for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, if, you know, of course, moving toward uh, using drones in, in place of boots on the ground, uh, which is a, a policy issue. I, I didn't really right. write about right. that, but uh, certainly that seems to be the, the direction that things are going. Yeah. So let's turn it over to you. Uh, we have microphones to my right and to my left. Uh, and if you have any questions about this book or any of your previous books, get up and, and ask. I think we've got about 10 minutes left or so. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm a big fan. Um, you tend to write a lot about subjects that people tend to be squeamish about. Do you have any um, techniques for getting people to talk about these in ways that they're more comfortable? Uh, you, by that you mean the people that I'm interviewing, the researchers or scientists? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they are. They tend to be squeamish topics. But if, if say, you're someone who researches human sexual response, or in women in particular, uh, having a conversation about the clitoris or about uh, the, the amount of blood in the vaginal walls. That's just your day to day. That's not so. They're not at all squeamish, and to, for them, it's like having a conversation about you know tire rotation or something. It's not. There's no charge to the topic. It's uh, it's it's actually very easy to step in and have a conversation with someone about their work because for them, it's just it's just their job. So I don't really have any techniques other than just being very straightforward with them. Yeah. Hi, yeah, I was interested. Um, during your research, did you go out to uh, Forest Glen, to the Museum of Military Medicine, to study any of the information that they have out there? And uh, if so, what was your impression? Um, I, I did not. I, I years ago went to the AFIP Museum, where they, where they have like the, the collection of bones and, and um, gunshot injuries and things like that. I don't know if that is. That's a, I know that AFIP museum moved. I don't know if that's where it moved. Is that a separate? That was the one that was at Walter Reed. Yeah. That's where it moved out to. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's in a brand new building. I haven't been, and I would, I would love to. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi. I love that you take one tiny topic and you go 10 miles deep with it, <laughs> or 100 miles deep. Do you find that there's one core message in all of your books. What's the one story you're always telling? If there's one core message, um, well, there are a couple of core messages. One is, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by the human body in extreme and unusual situations. Uh, and to me, you know, I used to, in my 20s, do a lot of uh, overseas just travel. I was just always looking to go to far flung, and the more remote, the better. And at a certain point, I realized the human body is a foreign planet, and it's so interesting to explore, and, and uh, I never get tired of it, and I, I still have so much to learn, so I, and I enjoy sort of sharing the learning with my readers. So, and and the, I guess the other core is scientists are, are so smart, fun, cool, and interesting. Uh, and I, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm some, I probably should have been one, but <laughs> uh, so being able to just, uh, 
you know, knock on these doors and, and step into these worlds and find out what people are doing uh, and just the commitment and passion that they have for their work is endlessly inspiring. So over and over, that's what I encounter. Yeah. Over here. Hi. Hi. Um, I have two thoughts. I want to try to tie them together because they're kind of related. So you mentioned when we first sat down, ro roachable territory, I think you said. So yeah. have you come across anything that you find is not approachable territory or maybe something you're not willing to talk about and kind of related. I know a lot of your books obviously are about the human experience, but you go into animal stuff. And for yes. me, that's hard for me to read personally. So yes. I've had to kind of like skip over some of that. Is there yes. anything you won't talk about? Oh, uh, yes. Well, I would say 90 some percent of science isn't particularly roachable because it's, it's gone into the microscopic, you know, it's molecular, it's genomic, it's, it's, uh, no, it's not bodies on a slab, which is really my terrain. And so I'm really, um, it's a, a very small sliver of science in a way. I'm kind of a gateway drug to science, uh, and I, I, which, which I, a role that I love. I love when um, young people read yeah. the book, get excited about science, and think, I want to do science. And then, of course, there they are in molecular biology going, damn you, Mary Roach, this is hard. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, they keep going, and then they go to medical school, and they become researchers or doctors, so, um, but have I, well, yes, I agree with you, the animal, there are the, the animal studies. I, I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, it, that is an interesting part of science. I, uh, I know a friend of mine uh, is an author, Rebecca Skloot, who wrote that book, The Mortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. She's working on a book right now about, I don't know, maybe I wasn't supposed to reveal that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say Spoiler that. Spoiler alert. But it's, it's, it has to do, because she used to be a veterinary t technician, so, mm -hmm. so it's about that whole world, and um, you know, it makes sense for her t to do that. I would be, whoops, I would be uh, un uncomfortable on a lot of levels. Also, my tone, I don't think, is appropriate, mm -hmm. and I, so that, yes, I agree with you. Um, and and there, the segments that you've skipped, the little, those are when people write like to me. kind of glance over. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, 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 <laughs> skimmed. You skimmed them, yeah. Skimmed, um, that yeah. People <laughs> will write to me and, uh, and share that, not in an angry way, but say, mm -hmm. I had trouble with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, you won't s probably see me doing that okay. as a topic. But, Thanks. Yeah. To the left, sir. Yes. Uh, on a related topic, what happens to those maggots after they've been used to, to <laughs> clean the wound? And, you, and the same question goes for leeches. Yeah. Oh, yes. After they're removed from the wound, they go to a maggot retirement community <laughs> um, where they're cared for and lavished with lots of lovely dead food. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if they're taken outdoors to go pupate. Hopefully, that, that hopefully they are. And I think having uh, the man who runs medical maggots is has such a you know after the book came out, he sent me this box with a little tube with alcohol and a bunch of little maggots in there as a gift for me. A little <laughs> just to, he has a I, I I like to think that they they are set free to become <laughs> flies. Okay. So, but I'm not entirely sure that that's true. <laughs> Uh, so we've got time for one more question, and it will be yours. Hey, pressure's on. Um, hello. Uh, so my question is, of all the scientists you've read about, of all the scientists you've met, who are a few who stand out to you as like unsung, unsung heroes? Oh, well, just because we happen to be on maggots, the George Peck, the maggot guy, um, <laughs> trying, trying to, to get the folks at Walter Reed to, to, say, you know, to, to see the value of this, because there are a lot of uh, problems with infection. And just, you know, this is a man who had me into his home, and he said, I've raised a clutch of maggots for you, so you can, and he came in, and this was at the dinner table, he had this little cut glass bowl, <laughs> and I thought it was chocolate pudding, but it was raw liver, and there were these maggots, and he said, and he said look at, look at them, and look at those, those mandibles can do what no surgeon can, and he had this passion for maggots, and, and I just love people like that. I mean, just, uh, anyway, George Peck comes to mind, but there are dozens of them. Excellent. Not maggots, scientists. <laughs> <laughs> scientists that I love. Yeah. Well, Mary, this was delightful. Thank you so much for, for Thank taking the time. Thank you so much. Thanks. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.